Have you seen anything that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Hello, and welcome to The Nexus. Did this whole coronavirus disaster begin in a Chinese lab? It is a question that has been posed for months now, and many people have written it off as a conspiracy theory. But President Trump and his Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the former head of the CIA, no less, believe it probably did. Okay, so today we're focusing on the top security lab in Wuhan at the center of those accusations. We'll be asking what kind of work goes on there. We know they study bats, but why? Also, how safe are these kinds of laboratories? This wouldn't be the first leak. And virus hunting in caves. Who is China's Batwoman? We'll be hearing from former UN weapons inspector Tim Trevan, plus lab designer and inspector Steve Robertson. We'll also hear from virus hunter Luis Rueda, who can tell us how dangerous it is to track down bats in the wild. But before we get to the Q&A, let's just get a quick reminder of President Trump's accusations and the Chinese response. Chinese authorities claim the virus surfaced at a wet market in Wuhan. But U.S. intelligence is investigating other theories, including whether the virus was accidentally released by a lab a few miles away that had been researching pathogens carried by bats. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. This Institute of Virology is the only facility in China that has a level four biosecurity regime because it handles the most dangerous viruses in the world, including a range of bat coronaviruses. Mr. Secretary, have you seen anything that gives you high confidence that it originated in that Wuhan lab? Martha, there's enormous evidence that that's where this began. We have not received any data or specific evidence from the US government relating to the purported origin of the virus. Do any of the investigations show that the virus originated in Wuhan or from the Wuhan Institute of Virology? As we said early on, there's no way this virus came from us. China is not the kind of country that would welcome a confession that one of its own laboratories was to blame for all this death and destruction. I'll miss her every day. Being here won't be the same without her. I feel for you. <laughs> China has a history of infecting the world, and they have a history of running substandard laboratories. When you put it all together, there is a very plausible hypothesis here that someone became infected in the laboratory, walked out, and started to infect other people in Wuhan. Well, plausible explanation or not, let's bring in our guest now. And we have Steve Robertson who designs and builds and inspects BSL-4 uh, level laboratories. And we also have Tim Trevan, who is a former UN weapons inspector, who is now a consultant specializing in biosecurity and biosafety. Uh, welcome to the show, both of you. Uh, Tim, I'd like to start with you. Um, about three years ago, you, you told the science journal Nature uh, that you were worried about the Wuhan Institute of Virology being cleared to handle the world's most dangerous pathogens. What were you concerned about? Well, let me put this in context. First of all, I believe that every country has the right to research dangerous pathogens that exist in their countries uh, so that they can address public health concerns and basic science concerns. So I'm not against China per se having a BSL-4 laboratory. What concerns me more is that these are very complex uh, institutions. When you operate a building with equipment as complex as this, you're not just dealing with engineering, you're dealing with human behavior as well. And here it's important to look at how the organization learns. For that, you need people to report everything that goes wrong, whether it's their fault or not, which means they have to be confident they won't be blamed and punished for speaking up. And they also need to feel confident to challenge their superiors when they see their superiors doing something wrong or recommending 
procedures that don't work. And this is what my concern was. If you have a, 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 a culture or if you have an organization which is very hierarchical and where there's a history of people being punished for speaking up, as we saw with coronavirus in the early days with the whistleblowers, and on top of that, you have a social culture where the elders are revered and you don't challenge them, then it's very difficult. It's not impossible, but it's very difficult for that culture to overcome those innate uh, behaviors to encourage people to speak up when they see things are going wrong. And so my prediction was, unless the Chinese addressed those issues directly and created a different type of culture within the laboratory, then they would be more prone to having accidents. And so it's clear that that hierarchical culture still exists. Tim, let me ask you about the three explanations that are being put forward. Now, in, in the early days, initially, China said that this all started at the Wuhan wet market. The coronavirus first jumped from animals to humans there. President Trump's indicating the Wuhan Institute of Virology only around 14 kilometers away. Others are suggesting that the virus was probably first transmitted in nature because so many people live near bats. What do you think is the most likely explanation of those three? Well, um, work has been done over the years to, to study these bat populations. And we do know that from that research that there are a large number of interactions between humans and wild animals in China, probably one to 77 million interactions a year from the research. And we do know that rural populations that live near the bat caves do have antibodies in their blood to coronaviruses, which we didn't know had already made the jump from bats to humans. So that is a very credible explanation. Of course, those bat caves where, where that research was done are a long way from Wuhan. But uh, we also know that what that lab in, in Wuhan was doing was collecting virus samples from bats and bringing bats and the, the viruses to the laboratory specifically to study those coronaviruses which evolved in nature. We're not talking about human-made viruses. We're still talking about naturally evolved viruses. But they were concentrating those viruses in a lab and specifically studying those viruses which were closest to making the jump into humans and causing human diseases. So can we rule out the possibility that there was a, uh, a release from the lab, uh, either through, for example, improperly handling waste or through a person getting a, a laboratory acquired infection and then going home and infecting other people or through someone selling one of the bats that was collected to the wet markets. No, we can't exclude that unless the Chinese authorities provide all the samples of the, uh, of the virus strains they were working on and enable third parties to analyze the genomes of those and compare them with the current COVID virus. And then we would be able to say, yes, it's exactly the same or no, it's not. But my understanding is a lot of the samples are being destroyed and uh, then they, they haven't, um, haven't cooperated so far with that sort of investigation. Now, for the third thing, the, the wet market, that is a very, uh, very viable explanation in, in general terms in that in those wet markets, you're bringing different species of animals together live. Uh, so you're getting more chance for viruses to spread between different animal species and create situations where uh, uh, viruses can pass through contact with humans into humans. So in general terms, wet markets are very, very high risk uh, locations for that sort of transfer of virus to human to happen. But on the other hand, if you look at the, uh, the data about when the spike of influenza-like illnesses happened in China, it was in the first couple of weeks of November, not in January, which is the, the story that was put out initially, that it was a wet market uh, uh, event that happened in January or, or late December, uh, not in early November. And my understanding is that when you look at the, uh, the contact tracing for those very early cases, they don't lead you to the market, they lead you to other places. Let's turn to the laboratories themselves now, and BSL-4 laboratories are built to a very high specification. They're inspected by people like Steve and then inspected again by the country's official body. Um, the highest security is a BSL-4, as we heard, then a three, and then a two, and then a one. 
the Wuhan Institute of Virology has China's only BSL-4 laboratory. China's Center for Disease Control in Wuhan, just 300 meters from the wet market, has a BSL-2 lab. And so the chances of a virus escaping from a BSL-4 laboratory are very small, so long, of course, as all the safety measures are adhered to. Access to biosafety level four labs or BSLs is highly restricted. Only microbiologists with specific training and who have been tested in BSL conditions are admitted. Typically, BSL research labs are housed in secure buildings. Once past the building security, it's on to a second barrier at the entrance of the laboratory suite itself. A security card or pin number, iris scan or fingerprint may be required or some combination of them. Then it's time to strip off and gown up. This can include wearing a full one suit that is sometimes air fed to ensure that if there is a puncture, air leaks out and not into the suit. Walk on through an airlock and a second barrier and another security check. And then you're in the lab itself and there it is, the glove box or isolator containing the pathogen. The glove box is held at negative pressure to the lab and the lab held at negative pressure to the room outside. So if there is a leak, the air only flows one way, in. All labs are inspected regularly for even a pinhole sized leak. So how can things go wrong? Through the air vents? Unlikely. All air passes through two H14 HEPA filters, 99.995% efficient for particles down to 0.2 microns in size. Waste disposal? Also unlikely. All waste is disposed of directly from the laboratory into an autoclave, which sterilizes the waste by heating it up to 134 degrees Celsius under high pressure. It then passes out of the autoclave and is usually incinerated on site. Every precaution is taken to reduce the risk of a leak or other accident. And yet, on rare occasions, they do still happen. So let's go to Steve Robinson. Now, Steve, you've helped to design and inspect these sorts of laboratories for decades. It does look almost impossible for things to go wrong, but they do, albeit rarely. Um, what are the potential problems a laboratory might experience? Well, though it was commissioned when it's new and proved to be working fully at that time, then, of course, these are uh, mechanical things, electrical things that can go wrong, and uh, well, people do. People can uh, fail to uh, follow all the procedures. So to deal with the, the fact that things can go wrong, such as filters leaking, there's a requirement to carry out regular reinspection of the facilities. So you would hope that if there was a problem that was developing, the regular inspection would identify that um, type of testing carried out. I mean, you should be able to spot even a pinhole leak in the uh, structure of the laboratory. So, and providing all those tests are carried out, it's extremely rare that a leak could come out through the building's structure. And do these There's, laboratories have built-in monitoring systems whereby if something is going wrong, it, it will be recorded? Yeah, the whole plan for the facility is that if something goes wrong, can you find out how you know that something has gone wrong? And also planning, what would you do in that event? So the pr air pressure in the facilities will be continually monitored. And if the air pressure, uh, they would normally run at a high negative pressure, if that starts to fall off, then you would expect an alarm to sound and you expect a, a secondary system to come in to try and control the pressures. Um, and if that doesn't work, then there'll be an automatic response to the system with alarms, um, and the users should make things safe uh, and close up any work they got on at the time. Right. Now, we, we know the air is highly filtered. The waste is very carefully managed. Um, but some people are putting it forward as an explanation that perhaps the researcher was infected inside the laboratory and literally walked it out um, inside their own body. Is that possible? It's certainly possible, but it would be extremely rare. If we look worldwide at laboratory acquired infections in these, um, we're, we're talking of around you know, one or two a year worldwide at most. The, if they're working in full suits, then those suits will be tested every time they put them on. They'll be using two layers of gloves, working in isolators. 
So it would be ext extremely unlikely that they would become infected that, that way. But you can never say it can't happen. I mean, there was a, a leak back in 2004 in a Beijing laboratory when they were studying SARS. So it does happen. Oh, certainly it does happen. Um, there has been one laboratory worker infected with Ebola that was being uh, um, handled inside a laboratory. Um, not a fatal, but uh, um, it still happened. Um, and these have been recorded, um, you know, for decades. Every time somebody gets infected, there's a record held. So we know about it. It's investigated and we learn from what's caused that. Um, so, yes, it can always happen. And now we've heard from another expert, Milton Lietenberg, who has told us about bat coronaviruses being studied uh, at the um, in Wuhan under BSL-2 conditions. He says that's inadequate. Uh, do you agree? And what is the primary differences between a BSL-2 and a BSL-4 laboratory? A BSL-2 laboratory is, is like a standard hospital pathology laboratory. So if you see any um, pathology work being carried out on the television or in science fiction or uh, um, police uh, 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 programs, then quite often that's going to be a level two laboratory where people are working just in laboratory coats and with gloves and open faced uh, safety cabinets. So they have some protection but nowhere near the level of protection that you get in a level four laboratory. Um, so there's a very, are very BSL, wide... Are BSL-2s inadequate to study bat coronaviruses? It depends exactly what you mean by studying them. In the UK at the moment, diagnostic work on clinical samples and patients can in many cases be carried out at BSL-2. But research into the virus itself, where you may be growing it up and concentrating it, would have to be at BSL free as a minimum and possibly at four. So you should not be doing research work at level two. Okay, uh, final question for you, Steve. Is there an international body uh, that inspects these laboratories at this level or, or is it left up to the, the nation state? There are um, national and international standards. Uh, the World Health Organization produces guidelines on how these are done, but it doesn't have uh, an automatic inspection right where it can come down look at a laboratory and shut it down that will be carried out by the national body that's concerned steve robertson thank you so much for your contribution to the nexus that's been a pleasure thank you well we still have tim trevan with us tim i'd like to draw your attention to the work of milton leitenberg a very respected figure in the arms control world i understand uh, he told us that uh, this is not a conspiracy theory but a legitimate question for several reasons and he mentions Amongst others, he says that you have to remember there were the lab leaks in Beijing in 2004 uh, while the Chinese uh, scientists were studying SARS. He also points out to that flurry of activity back in February this year where you had President Xi Jinping saying that uh, it was very important to uh, have better biosecurity. And then quickly afterwards, we had uh, the ministry in charge of that uh, bringing in new um, policies, if you like, stricter measures for biosafety, especially around the handling of viruses. And he's really trying to paint a picture here of a country with a history of leaks, cover-ups, and now in panic, it seems. Yes, and uh, there are certainly questions that arise from that, which I think the Chinese authorities do need to explain to the world. If they don't address them, uh, conspiracy theories and uh, doubts about their motives will just multiply over time. So this goes back to the point I was making about complex systems and learning. You need to have openness. You need to have transparency. You need to have people questioning things and then getting answers to those questions. And without those, then people will doubt the motives of the Chinese authorities and, and the actions of the people in the lab. We had that in Iraq. Uh, you have to be a little careful about reading motivations into observed actions because it can be other reasons why they're panicking that way. Uh, for example, in, in Iraq, we thought that a lot of what they were doing was because they were hiding weapons from us in the, in the second iteration of, of the inspections. Uh, but what it turned out to be is that they didn't want their neighbors to know that they didn't have the weapons. So you, you, when you start imputing intentions to others, you can also be misled by, by these things. You have to be very careful. Certainly that doesn't stop you asking the questions and demanding answers, but it doesn't necessarily provide a smoking gun. Right, but they could, they could, if they're feeling confident in that they've done no wrong, they could just invite 
an international investigation team to come over, but they don't, do they? That's correct. And that would be the easiest way to clear up these issues is to have an international okay. team, not an American team, but an international team Indeed. led by something right, like the WHO. Okay, let's let's look at the head of the BSL-4 lab in Wuhan now. She's a very interesting woman, uh, not only a leading virologist, uh, she's also spent years collecting SARS-like coronaviruses from bats in the field. Uh, her name's Dr. Xi, and uh, she's has developed this nickname as China's Batwoman. Uh, back in March, she told the Scientific American Journal that she was worried for days that the virus may have leaked from her lab, and then she checked her records, and she was relieved to find that wasn't the case. Tim, do you accept Dr. Xi's explanation at face value, or would you want to see her records, for example, to be sure? Well, I, I'm not sure that even checking your records would necessarily uh, give you the answer to that question. Um, we, we heard from Steve earlier that lab-acquired uh, infections are very rare in BSL-4 facilities, but we also know from research done that only about 20% of lab-acquired infections across all types of laboratories get reported. People either are unaware they've been infected or they uh, are, are scared of being uh, reporting it because that means they're in quarantine, they may get punished for, for things. So, uh, you know, the documentation wouldn't necessarily give you that degree of assurance that it absolutely did not come from your lab. I'm not saying that that's proof that it did. I'm just saying you can't get to that 100% assurance just from documentation. Okay, well, we're running out of time. But before we go, I just want to bring in some new video and a new guest. Here's the video first, and it shows a senior technician from the Wuhan Center for Disease Control collecting samples from bats in caves in Hubei province. <laughs> Okay, let's discuss this video now with our final guest, Luis Ruedas. He is a biologist who goes all over the world looking for new species of creatures, including bats, and also looking for new viruses. Uh, Luis, what do you make of this video? Well, Matt, when I looked at the video, it seemed to me to be a sort of propaganda piece that, <clears throat> that was made perhaps to entice youth into positions such as this uh, gentleman was in, that of a field virologist. So insofar as hypothesizing that that's the type of situation and perhaps lackadaisical approach to health that this person takes, maybe it's not perhaps the best testament. You're, you're basically saying that it's probably for publicity anyway, we shouldn't take it too seriously. Other experts have said it shows like you say, a lackadaisical approach. It is not adequate uh, PPE for a job like that. So, Tim, if you could just explain why. Basically, I think if you're going into a cave or something like that to, to collect bats, you've got various hazards that you don't have in the laboratory. Uh, you're going over uneven uh, ground. You're passing maybe sharp rocks or squeezing through tight spaces. There's bat poop and bat pee coming from above and below. Uh, you really want to be, if I were doing it, I would really want to have full body covering of fairly durable material, uh, not just neoprene gloves, but uh, 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 more durable gloves than that. Because although this is a respiratory disease, uh, the ACE2 receptors to which it binds are found pretty much throughout the body. They're in the epithelial cells of, the, of the, the blood vessels, for example. If you have open skin with an abrasion, uh, I, I don't know if this is a, a proven route of infection, but it would be something I would worry about. Yeah. Certainly there is evidence that it does uh, go through the ocular route as well. So uh, I, will, I will want to uh, make sure my people were fully protected. Louise, when you go out on uh, you know, search missions like this, what kind of uh, protective equipment do you wear? Uh, we wear full respiratory uh, protection when we go into any sort of situation like this. We wear rubber gloves and leather gloves over the rubber gloves to protect them. We also wear Tyvek suits to protect us from any sort of virus. And how serious is the risk of picking up a bat-linked coronavirus whilst you're doing this work? I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> I've well, been working with bats for about... Uh, 40 years now, um, 
I'm sure I've been exposed to some coronaviruses. Fortunately, I've not come down with any illness. It's possible that exposure to different coronaviruses potentially confers some sort of protection for other coronaviruses, or I've just been lucky. Yeah. But the risk is definitely present. Well, Louise, I wish you continued luck in your work. I know you've got your eye on another project. Uh, we're not going to disclose it on the program because it's, <laughs> but I understand it's uh, somewhere in the Far East. So I wish you luck with that. And Tim Trivan, thank you also for coming on the program. And thank you at home for watching. Really appreciate it. Maybe you can see this episode and all our previous episodes on our channel on YouTube. Until next week then, goodbye.